staple. I went to a restaurant, I think in St. Louis, and they had some, uh, they call it whole cakes, or somebody called it uh, water bread, pan fried, whatever it is. <coughs> a lot of folks, that was what they had to have. And then they have a, a fork or a spoon. They use their fingers, right, y'all? You can tell when they really got good, they went to doing this right here with it. But today, you have to go to a, find a restaurant for those kind of things. Uh, they're not readily available. We talk about today, but the faith, but uh, but our faithfulness. Not, I'm going to talk about. You, you can't talk about faithfulness while talking about God. I'm talking about His faithfulness. Um, one scripture that I many years ago caught a hold of, and I remembered and quoted quite often. Psalms 15 and 4. It's in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, and he that swear to his own hurt and changes not. Like if you make a deal, I made a deal with the one, so I used to do a lot of travel around, do work around Ipstein, Ann Arbor area. And I ran to a guy, had a, his, his wife was mad at him, and she would sell everything reminding him of her, reminding her of him. He had a nice little lawnmower, I took it home, cleaned it up, painted it, and told the person I was gonna sell it to him, but I found out it was worth a whole lot more than I was selling it for. But I had to stick to my word. I have it right because it's still in my possession. I tell people when you do business, it's a dollar to seal a deal. If you put the money on that, person can change and don't owe you nothing. This piece of property you on right down the street down here, the, the, the gentleman has sold it to somebody else. And we had a revival, something going on here, and I was walking down the street talking to him. He says, but the, the neighbors, you know, and I talked to him about it. Now, he had a deal written out on paper. But he, he conferred with someone and says it's only a deal when it's written up on a real estate contract. And he said the neighbors said they rather see the church have it. So he sold it to me. And I bought it from him just like that. The people we promised it to, they're going to put a whole house there. But we own a lot. Now, that same lot, I know it's, it's, it's more than a lot. He, would do, he was a, quite a fisherman. He would dump a lot of his fish parts in that lawn. It's a very fruitful garden. But we own it now. When you make a war, you make a deal, and you say something. I remember a kid, one of the saints said, uh, when they first got saved, whenever these church doors are open, I'm going to be here. Well, as time went on, that changed. And we sang songs like, I made a vow to the Lord, and I won't take it back. That was a, that was a part of our worship services. But nowadays, uh, how can I say this? People lie. Don't even bother them. You, you try to call me a lot, and I ain't called you one. You are one. <laughs> well, when you say you're gonna do something, you don't do it. Some, now, some people, I remember Sister B one time had a job, and the job you had you gonna quit, and the lady wanted the job, you gonna give it to her and change your mind. The lady got mad, she was fighting mad. Remember that lady that time, B? Yeah. People depend on what you say. Uh, the only option they have is the one you offer them. The Bible says a good name is rather be chosen above the price of rubies. 
And what it's saying is right here. If I gave you everything I got, I'm still better off than you because when you run out of what I gave you, you broke again. But my good name will gain me wealth all over again. I know the connection. I know the processing people who were millionaires retired and made another millionaire on a hobby job. They know the principles of making money. They're faithful to the process. Some people can give a million dollar plan and they will, they will not follow the plan. Let's go down here for a moment here to the scriptures. Um, faithfulness is steadfastness, consistency, or allegiance. It is carefulness in keeping what we are entrusted with. Now, that's the ministry. Paul was entrusted with the, the gospel age. He says it was entrusted to him. He was so to such a degree he called it my gospel. He owned it to the degree became a part of him, and he suffered for it. He was, one case I was reading and studying Paul's his writings, these Paul says, I press, I'm trying to get an understanding, like I shared this story before, and I kept reading different ways. I studied different translations, different commentaries. I, I hit a wall, the Holy Ghost said to me, if you want to understand what he's saying, you got to study his whole life. The simplicity of certain statements is tied up in somebody's life. So I went and found another book I read on Paul before, and I was, first of all, I read Paul's back in the 80s, might have been. I said, God, what's wrong? What is this? Like, I know this guy. I fell in love with Lord. He was a friend of mine. Lord says, Paul is the closest display to the spirit of Christ in the New Testament age revealed in this person than anybody else. So what you fell in love with is the spirit that's in him. It's still evident. I call it the spirit of the writer. For those who study, you can gain when Paul said, uh, Isaiah said, you're a king of Zion, I die. You can, you can learn the same thing Isaiah felt. If you study, fast, and pray, and see God, God will take you to that same place, give that same conviction and understanding to the degree you can teach it or preach it. And so then, uh, it is the conviction that the scriptures accurately reflect reality. Biblical faithfulness requires belief in what the Bible says about God. I'm going to go ahead myself a little bit. That's probably Israel had. Israel didn't know God. It took those 40 years in the wilderness, and when Moses said to God, who should I tell them that sent me? He said, tell them, to my Israel now, that I am, that I am. They didn't know God. They know God no more than Pharaoh knew him. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? That should obey him. So faithfulness, part of required, because a certain level of growth in God, you're going to miss some of his enemies. Not only people, but demons. If you know God, it will not break your faithfulness. Sometimes people's lives are dependent on you. Now here's what happened. I, in my observation is thinking, some people learn faithfulness because they saw it displayed in their parents. But the greatest amount of faith, I say a little bit, is one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that God does in the heart of the believer. And so with God, watch, with God, 400 years is temporary. For us, that's eternal. We ain't going to live that long, right or wrong. But Bible says after 430 years, he brought him out that self-same day. God will wait that long. He waited for Abraham, was the father of the faithful. He waited 25 years. For promise of Isaac. But he didn't just wait. He waited patiently. That's, that's, that's faithfulness. It's patience as well. Some things in, 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 in serving I didn't understand. But I learned to have confidence in the person I was following. And then later on, so even Elisha in his ministry, his Noah's notoriety came from initially. He was known as the man to wash the hands of Elisha. So we know about his miracles and stuff, but in the Bible, I saw the scripture text, said he was known by the man that washed the hands of Elisha. So sometimes in faithfulness, God raised up uh, uh, Aaron and Joshua to serve Moses, to do that great task of leading several, or well, at least two million people out. And it, and it, and it wore on him. 
He got mad and got mad and smote the rock and spoke and said, you stiff-necked people, must we bring? He didn't sanctify. The people got to him. I'm going to say to every leader, this year, every leader needs somebody praying for them because the tests are going to hit you. The Bible says, be not worried. You're going to get tired. That's, that's, that's in life. Well, so you ain't got to be a preacher to get tired and write somebody. Just get an old man, get tired. Uh, we discussed the other day with Geraldine's funeral. He was talking about serving the family. I said, we don't have the mothers, the grandmothers not cooking for us. Some mother uh, home and sister, sort of thing, frying chicken to make them potato salad no more. The grandmother's now babysitting and working at Walmart. They depend on the parents to watch their kids. And Brenda Smith, the person I have the highest respect for because she paid her mother the standard rate of babysitting to watch her son. Everybody knows they, they think they're blessed because they can do it for nothing. And she, they not only watch them, they watch them, they feed them right around, take them for walks, take them to the store, take them to McDonald's. See, when we went to school, when I was a kid, we didn't know what a McDonald was. If you want a pizza, you made one. Chef boy, I did. Because <laughs> Domino's made right near Salani. Started right near Salani down on, on Cross Street down there. But the kids, they want, they want, they got their menu made out. I want one kid with McDonald's, one with Wendy's, one with Burger King. And they expect you to go to all three of them with your money. When we were on the same house, they had a bicycle. My daughter outgrown. And my granddaughter, I gave it to, and the boy said, and he showed me a picture of a little motorcycle. And, on his daddy's phone, he wanted. I said, You're gonna bring it with your money? He said, no, yeah, I got money in his card. <laughs> <laughs> but back to the main point in faithfulness and all of that changing of life from being a youth and vibrant and young. And I, 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 let me just stop for a moment. Let's pause for a moment. What are some of the ages you are when you got saved? How, how old are you now? See there? Who else? 32, how old are you now? 83. 50-something years ago. Yeah. 23. See there? 16. 16. And still serving God and, and changes have come in our life that redefined us. But still determined to serve God. And to some degree, if we're not careful, the world would change our idea of faithfulness. Let me go a little further. Uh... The biblical faithfulness requires belief in what the Bible says about God, his existence, his work, his character. Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. It is the result of the Spirit working in us. But the Spirit is also our seal of faithfulness. He is our witness to God's promise that if we accept the truth about God, he will save us. Um, if a note in Galatians 5.22 tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the result of the Spirit's presence in the life of a Christian. The Bible makes it clear that everyone uh, receives the Holy Spirit the moment uh, they believe, or we used to call it speak in tongues, uh, and in Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, one of the primary purposes of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives is changing that life. It is the Holy Spirit's job to conform us to the image of Christ and making us more like him. And Christ was faithful in all things right or wrong. I did a study from, from Palm Sunday to his crucifixion. It's amazing. Like, Jesus, I did a PowerPoint to show the little map. Like he was nervous. Most of the New Testament happened in the last week of his life. Most of it. What he was trying to do, he was trying to fulfill the scriptures. See, it was written of me. So do we search to see what's written of us? Watch what we said we were called to do. Are we still doing it? God, who does the impossible by the grace of his spirit, enables and I'm sure I go back and show you, and strengthens us so we can do that which we could not do. But we tell him, no, Lord, that's enough. You done gone too far now. 
And so then Hebrews 11 gives us a long list of faithful men and women in the Old Testament who trusted God. Abel's, Abel's understanding of God made his sacrifice real and authentic. Noah trusted God's word about the coming judgment as well as God's promise to save his family in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And Abraham and Sarah believed against all evidence that they would have a child. It's Genesis 21, verse 1 through 34. But I tell you, my wife and I, we waited for 17 years. In the beginning, it was no big deal. We just, well, I want some kids, I ain't worried about it. But the end of that 17 years, it was getting rough. The desire in your heart, longing for something that you have no power over. Sometimes you wait for God to fulfill a promise, and some, everybody else is moving on, getting the house, getting married, and it can be very rough on a person's faith. And that wasn't rough for me. I, I began to ask God another kind of way and believe God. But God is faithful. How many of you know God is faithful? Yes, sir. It was just the same God that saved us at 15, 44, 34. He's the same God today. He had to go to school to learn how to be a bigger God. He's a, just a bigger God then as he is now. Amen? Amen. And so then, uh, faith um, Enoch, who obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is rewarder of those who seek him. But faith or a faithful commitment to who God says he is is basic to walking with God. As Jesus traveled, he responded to people's faith and curtailed his involvement where, he were, where there was no faith. So his prophet's involvement, they had to have faith. So on occasion, on occasion, Jesus said, clear the room out and pray for your man. He was raised because they mocked him. But you got to understand, sometimes some, when God begins to increase your faith and do the greater work, somebody's not going to believe you. Who do you think they are? They must be after something. They're just serving God. Faithfulness, watch this, 30 years ago, and it's how many years today. With COVID being here, a lot of people were, were challenged. Their faith was challenged. And some are being cautious, right or wrong. Uh, I was in the hospital. I had COVID, but others in the hospital, they tell you, you can't come in. Some of you going to pray for them until you got to put on a gown and put rubber gloves on and, and get your, those gloves to anoint them with. What's he going to do? Is God still a healer? And on the way to see Jesse, I had to take a, my wife let me off the front door. I walked from the front door to the elevator and I had to sit down for a while and get my rest because I, mean, I still can't do long distances. I took a break, five, ten minutes, got on the elevator, went up to her floor and sat down again, then went to her room. The doctor said you can go in, but you're going to need to wear a glove because this, that, and the other, and she's heavily sedated. It's still the same thing we committed ourselves to. I'm not being foolish. I'm not going in raw, no gloves, and nothing else hanging out and breathing. I didn't wake her up. I just anointed her hair with oil and prayed and left. People need help more today than they did when I first got saved. You know why? Because the saints were praying. They were called on God's. The songs said, hold to God's unchanging hand. So faith is sometimes not so much uh, hold on to God, watch this, but allowing God to hold on to us. Some things we go through, we wouldn't make it if God would not have helped us. Am I right or wrong? We wept, we cried, oh God, have mercy, help me, Jesus. And some said, we'll try to go for a ride around the lake. Go for a ride somewhere to Las Vegas or whatever. God said, no, you don't get no rest in Las Vegas. You get rest at my throne. Am I right, somebody? So Enoch understood that God rewards those who seek him and trust him with all their hearts. We trust what God does because we trust him, not the other way around. In other words, we trust God even when he is silent. And we notice and we see no miracles. That is part of faithfulness. We know God is reliable, steadfast, and true. So the scripture I had here in the book of uh, Timothy I want to share with you. I'm going to make that scripture right quick. 2 Timothy 
2.13. Very powerful scripture. Somebody read it for me, please. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now, the earliest scripture tell you that certain things are personal if they don't trust God. But here he's saying, watch this, whatever we do, God's going to be faithful to his word. We can stop trusting him, but he's still going to do his word. Would you agree God reaches out to save us, to encourage us, to bring us back in line? And Bishop Brooks was preaching, he says, uh, I say, how do you say that? You see, he said, God don't, didn't need me, but I realized he wanted me. He loved you enough to make the effort to organize some circumstances in our life to bring us confrontation to the word of God. And being faithful. Some have walked with God uh, by themselves when they were married. They kept coming. Kept coming. Raising the kids. Bring the kids with them. Companion wouldn't come. Just kept coming. Till what? God showed himself faithful, and saved their companion. There was no complaining, there was no crying, this ain't right, this ain't fair. And what's it right here? I can testify for a moment, I can call no names up, they know what I'm talking about, the person I'm talking about. One person told me a story, they was in the bathroom, the sister, they're talking about the way they were dressing. And they said, they heard him. Came out confront him and said, I'm just trying to keep my husband. Now, everybody knows what you got to do for your family, right or wrong. And the Bible says the contempt is every wife does that which pleases her own husband. Is that what it says? Not the pastor, but her husband. And you got to know what it takes to please him, and vice versa. There's times you need to take a break and go somewhere and spend some time alone. But being faithful to God, I said to God once I was feeling tired about something else, I was crying out and I'm repenting. And God said to me, Son, you're human. You don't control life. All the spec you do when you get some rest is pick up where you left off at. You can't do everything perfectly. You can't be at every service. But, but when you're faithful to God, what's in your soul, there's something in you that drives you. I got to be there. I want to be there to serve him in case I'm needed to bring glory to God. Not, not to myself, but to him. People think you want something. I don't want nothing. I'm just here because I love the Lord. I'm here to serve. But there were times I had to, one more time, my wife came to Bible class, honey, I'm not, I'm not going on that, I'm tired. And I stayed on. I was tired. And she told me what happened in Bible class that night. But there's times, humanly speaking, as the older you get, the more, the more you realize the frailty of your humanity. Bishop Singleton told me a story once, a young man said, how you doing, Bishop? He said, young man, if I told you, you wouldn't understand. So I've been young, but you ain't never been old. <laughs> The things that happen ain't got nothing to do with what you want to do, right or wrong. But I said, how you doing? I said, a little bit better than I was yesterday. And I seen people in the airport, somebody saw me, had my mask on, and somebody sitting there talking to another, uh, a pastor, and they knew who I was. So I thought you saw, I thought you saw, you saw a young man, which meaning that my strength is coming back. It's not back yet, but I'm not glorying in it. I feel something better. Somebody told me, so most people have the condition you have, their skin changes color, but yours have gotten brighter. I ain't quite yellow yet, but I can't. <laughs> but the Lord is helping me. He's, I believe healing is nigh my house. Amen. And so then, um, He's rewarded those who seek Him. Faith or faithful commitment to who God says He is is basic walking with God. Uh, and so, but Enoch understood that God rewards those who seek him and trust him with all their hearts. So then the question becomes, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, what, with all your heart, all your soul, and, say, and not a part-time love. And so today's world, we have so many distractions, would you agree? So many distractions. We're allowed to do things we couldn't afford. Uh, some people are poor. Their main entertainment was worshiping God. The time of the occasion, when I first got saved, a young man, somebody said, uh, one of my friend's mother said, 
Uh, Harry, now you're sanctified, are you satisfied? Those are terms they were used like that. But now they didn't say saved. When I come along, it was a shame to have drums and stuff in certain nominal churches. Now they are hiring our people to play for them. They want our sound. I can step for that. Now they own uh, social media showing themselves shouting. They, they shouting. They filming it and shouting. They made fun of us. You, you, my, brother, my brother said, uh, you, do you do that holy dance, Harry? <laughs> but everybody today is trying to dance. Right. Oh, they're, they're filming it without the Holy Ghost. But that's not necessarily faithfulness. Faithfulness is serving God. So it comes to a point and say, Lord, if it's just me, if all I can do is let my light shine, let me let it shine. Let me see that I'm faithful to God. When I come out of that sick room, hospital out of that coma, my desire was to show God faithful and come back and stand in the midst of the saints and say, God's a deliverer. Yes. So I said, I heard you wasn't feeling well. I said, look at me now. Mm -hmm. I'm standing right in front of you now. I'm not, I ain't no bad. I'm doing good. So all, some people remember the bad news. There's some good news to be had. God is faithful. Amen? Yeah. It's amazing. People can tell. They say, I can tell by your, your voice sounds different. I, I know those little sounds were in strength. Your voice can tell the level of strength you have. It can tell when you're weak. I call some time I said, none you just get out of bed or something? <laughs> I can tell by your, well, your voice sound when you just, just got up or not. I call it the early morning gruff. You know? But even when joy is in your soul. And so Enoch understood that God rewards those who seek him and trust with all their hearts. We trust what God does because we trust him not the other way around. In other words, we trust God even when he is silent. When we see no miracles. And Israel saw a miracle every day for 40 years. Watch this. To the degree it no longer became a miracle. It just some, some more manna and some more water. In the meantime, their clothes wasn't wearing, wearing out, their shoes wasn't wearing out. We see miracles so much, we can take it for granted. But someone about this, the great is thy faithfulness. There's no shadow of turning in thee. So we begin to recognize. I learned one thing God has taught me in recovering from my illness. A, a gracious person is a person who understands that grace has been extended to them. To say, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I said, my little grandson, thank you, Olivia, I appreciate it so much. I don't say, come here, give, give me this. I said, thank you so much, I appreciate it. This moment for me to go from here to there is a major challenge. And she come and get to me, I said, thank you. She's growing and get no big, no big deal. Now I'm careful, I ask my wife, because I'm gonna, think I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be wearing her out. But you understand, it's the grace of God that God has put people in your life to help you. So therefore, we're faithful to God and encouraging others as well to be faithful to him. So I'm studying now, in order to increase my faith, I got to study. I got to pray. I got to fast. If you want more of God, you got you to feed the inner man. Amen? Amen? So, and none of the Old Testament saints lived to see their Messiah, but they were faithful. They believed God would do as he promised. They lived by faith and not by sight. That's in, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. Faithfulness is believing that God is who he says he is and continuing in that belief despite uh, the, the changing of life. Uh, that means that we trust what God says in the Bible and not necessarily what the world or our own eyes tell us. Things can look bad sometimes. But here's the key again. When I came along, life was a lot simpler. Most people, all they wanted was a job, right or wrong. Right. Uh, London told me the story. His mother worked for somebody who worked as uh, an executive in Ford Motor Company. London, remember that story you told me? Yes, sir. And asked the man, what's it right here? Here's the simplicity of it all. She wasn't a high-powered person, but she was a faithful woman that worked for a Ford executive. And said, could you do me a favor, please, and write me a letter so my son can get a job at Ford Motor Company. Now, this is like the woman with Naaman, the little girl. I didn't tell her name. But she has such character that Naaman respected what she said and, and went to see the prophet. And the prophet told her to go wash in Jordan. He got mad. 
And she says, Master, if he had told you some great thing, would you not have done it? So that's a speak of her character. Her character allowed her to have that conversation without being punished. So this guy writes his mother a letter, right? That's right. And he works 30 years and retired. And watch this, done, and still getting paid retirement. Amen. That's faithfulness. Yeah. Somebody's reputation can put a good word in for somebody else. Yeah. As I'm studying the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is right here. It's not only us being saved, not sinning, not breaking the commandments, but the work of God is growing to such an extent that people know that God has to be in our midst. And whatever he's doing in there, I want that in my life. So the work becomes a testimony, not just me giving an outline of scriptures and do you have the Holy Ghost, just the work itself. Someone called me today and says, uh, I saw something Bishop Brooks was doing online, that's my housing project. So I, so I talked about the Owens and Pastor. I realized a lot of stuff you're doing already and nobody even knows. I know it, but I do what I can. I do what I can with reference to the help we have. Some things we acquire a lot more uh, professional training. Uh, we, have, we own some houses. We collect rent. And brother owns us that. They do repairs. He takes care of that. The parking lot, the doors. But nobody never, however, says, can I help you, Brother Ryan? So I have to have mercy on him. But also, he does a lot more stuff because I shared in one of the lessons I did about the gifts. Some of those gifts you had naturally, God enhances them. When you're faithful, God will add to your portion. The story when, when David brings back the Ark of the Covenant, and one of the men reached out to, to stop it from falling, and God strikes him dead. And David is grieved and parks it at Obed Edom House. Now, I can make a little bit of analogy here for a moment. He parks the, the, the Ark of the Covenant at Obed Edom's house. And all of a sudden, they notice that Obed Edom is getting new carpet, new drapes, the driveway being dug up and extended down, going from asphalt to concrete, get a new roof put on the house, to put an addition on the back. He knows he's prospering. So let's get this thing together and bring it on down to the house of God. Faithfulness will bring favor, and God will use you as a showcase of his glory. That's really all about God being glorified. And not just being faithful. You, you've been being faithful. You may put 20, 30 years in serving God and then realize how long you've been working until you may hear somebody else talking about it. I've been in this for 30 years, man. I was talking to some guys in Africa, but Beth, they put me in line, some guys over in a company called, country called Mowali. It's about 37 pastors who want to become a part of our fellowship. I'm talking on the phone. Uh, might be Zoom or what's, what's that, what it was. I asked one gentleman, how long have you been pastor? He said 10 years. You've been pastoring 10 years without any support or training. But he wants to, that's a major statement to me. You're going to start a church, don't know nothing about a church, but you have to burden your heart to do it. You've been doing it for 10 years. All they want is somebody to train and help them. Another friend of mine said, William Dawson said, he said, you want me to go over there for you and train them? That's another level of faithfulness. Do you want me to go for you? I'll go. Then Brother Owen said, Pastor, we can do it. We get a team together. We can go over next year uh, and help, help you out. You ain't got to go. We'll go for it. So that's another whole level. We count what we do and we quit. When God's grace is willing to supply more and prosper us. And Dawson told me a story, he says, when he told the story that he was preaching on the Sunday, he says, uh, Bishop Abney asked him about a car yet, he gave him the car. He gave him the keys to the car as a, as a jack. He said, Bishop Abney and with the car, Bishop Pratt, he said, son, he said, wealth when you're young is different than when you're old. When you're older, your wealth is passed on to your children. You ain't got time to spend all that stuff. So you're gathering to pass it on. When you're young, you're establishing a house, but you're also going to establish your insurance policy and things of that sort. So the faithfulness of God, now God, is dealing with your mind to expand you to show that this, with what I've given you, that's what they did with Abraham. When Abraham was in that vision, and Abraham understood that vision, that he could not contain the blessing that God revealed to him. The Bible said, and I have scripture go, uh, and the word of the Lord was in the mind of Abraham, and here's the picture I get right here. The word of God was walking around through his mind and caused him to see stuff a regular person couldn't dream in a lifetime. And Abraham says, how can these things be seeing there's none in my house but Eliezer of Damascus? 
In other words, what God had ordained. Just show me the vision. He knew he needed more. He needed an heir. And God said, no, I'm going to give you your own seed. Here's the point I make right here. Some things God has given me. Didn't. Johnny James just passed. They finally set the funeral arrangements for his burial. It's the same day as Geraldine's. But are you going to, are you going to camp? No, I'm going, I'm going to be here. Uh, and I called his son and me left. I heard and talked to Jock. Jock had just got to, to Springfield with his mom and the rest of his siblings. But Johnny James gave a lot. And he didn't ask so much. I was a state coordinator back then on the David Burchett, your brother. When Bishop, we had a state young people meeting in Detroit, the Bishop David Ellison Church. And I asked David, can we have a room? Do we have prayer in all day long? I met Jackie Wilson at that particular meeting and some other friends I met over the years. And Bishop Wagner got paid more for preaching one night than John James got teaching the whole week. That's the value we put on the word. I know because I was in the back room with them when they counted the money when they made the checks out. Wagner got paid more for one night than John James got paid for the whole week. And to some degree, I, I was at a funeral recently, another old saint that died, and they said about 12, 13 kids, and it's for every Christmas, they got a Goodwill box. But their mother made them a fruit basket full of fruit because they couldn't afford to give them no gifts. And somebody at the funeral gave each one of the kids a fruit basket to remember their mother's kindness because they didn't have much. A lot of people gave their lives up. That's faithfulness. There was no, no house, no car. They, they did not, and, they, and one, somebody they called Florida, it's called Florida Petticoat Junction. You know why? Because the men had to work in their fields. There's women that started churches. It was mostly women that passed in those areas because men couldn't afford to leave the, leave the field. That's where they lived. The living was in the field. It was in the crops. It wasn't no factory. That's why a lot of the young guys went to the factory area because people making money. But in certain areas, their means of trade is vegetables and chicken. That's why I finally figured out. That's why the preacher ate up all the chicken. That's all he's going to get paid for the rest of the week. I figured it out. My wife's father was a preacher, Methodist preacher. He said, she stayed in the back room and said, oh, boy, he's the most, oh, Lord, there's the last, there's the last leg. <laughs> but that was his pay. That's what they had. They didn't have money. They had produce and livestock. So that's faithfulness another whole level, right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. And you had to wait on God to supply. But besides that, and I'm walking with God, how many times did God had to carry our burden for us. How many people in the Bible? Enoch walked with God, and he was not. I said to Enoch, there's a couple other Enochs in the Bible. Anybody know those Enochs? And they weren't good, were they? So now he's concerned. Watch my, watch it. Uh, I say, it's, this guy sitting right here, this imaginary guy sitting here, and he's a murderer. He's been to prison. Everybody knows it. And he has kids. His kids got to suffer that reputation. He's there to kill somebody. Watch this right here. If I shot a man in self-defense, they're going to say, that's a preacher to kill that man. It's not as easy as defending yourself. You can kill a guy breaking your house, and everybody in town knows he's a low-down, dirty crook. But guess what? His friends are coming looking for you because you killed my boy. Ain't that easy as defending yourself? I think it's going to go be, it's going to move beyond that. But God in his graciousness does not hold us accountable for the foolishness he saved us from. Am I right, somebody? Amen. As though he hadn't done nothing. He raises up in esteem us, put a word in our mouth, put a, call us to prayer, and call souls to be delivered by our prayers. Amen? Isn't that, isn't that something? So then, um, we trust he will work out everything for good. We trust he will work his will in us. We trust that our situation on earth is nothing compared to our future reward in heaven. The only way we can have such faith is by God's Spirit's influence. He can bring to mind things we've forgotten. Speak to our despair and cause us to hope. So a person being faithful goes to a lot of stuff. They're not just faithful. It's a cost of being faithful. Right or wrong? 
How many times when we come to church, we'll decide what we're going to do? Child at home sick. A car broke down. Don't have enough money. Maybe the furnace is broken. You ain't talking about it. Nobody knows anything about it. They say, oh, praise the Lord. They ain't got no problem. Girl, if you only knew. But what? But God is faithful. And you keep going. Because what? He delivers us from every. Paul says, the scripture I love, what Paul said, and he snatched me from the mouth of lions. People tried to kill him. I had a list. I had a list of my notes here that all the things Paul went through. The minister went through so much, but he never stopped preaching. Well, Paul in the book of Romans talking about going to Rome, he talked like he was going on a cruise liner ship, but he ends up being shackled in the bow of a ship as a slave between two different soldiers. And when he got there, that my study, there were people at the dock waiting. They heard of his coming and they loved him. They were there to meet him. He came with show and chains. And in one occasion, he was released. And then in prison again. This was under, what's that guy's name, that uh, terrible ruler in Rome? Fox Book of Martin, who burned the people alive? Nero. 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 And there ain't no chance. He, Nero didn't like Jews or Christians. Now, Paul was in prison twice. But the second time, there's no hope of appeal. This guy is terrible. You mean the, the worst man in history who is now has control and determined you are going to have your head cut off. But Paul didn't lose. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not careful how we're going to answer you. See, if he don't deliver us, what? Do we have that kind of faith in God? No, if you don't, then big deal to say, Lord, help me. Lord, help thou my unbelief. Here's what I'm learning. Saying. I'm learning not to respond to negative stuff. I was at the convention. Somebody asked about one of the saints. And I said, well, they're all right, I guess. You know? you know what I mean? I don't, I don't do that. I don't discuss negative traits on people. I don't get in those kind of conversations. And they're still alive. They're somewhere and whatever. So in my faithfulness, I don't want nothing to hinder God's favor for my life. I want to have the spirit of Christ. Christ said, oh, he didn't say, uh, uh, Thomas, that, that fool don't believe nothing. He shows up, what was it, a week later, a day later? He said, Thomas, what? Thrust your hand to my side. I call him doubting Thomas. No, he only doubted for a short while. And he says what? He said, my Lord and my God. He knew who he was. Do we know who the, who the Lord is? How did he save us? He gave us a plan, the repentance and remission of sins. We preached his name beginning at Jerusalem. He gave us that plan. Paul was given the revelation to have both the Jews and the Gentiles be, be God will bring them into one. That's his faithfulness. He didn't leave us out there to die into a devil's hell. But there's one case I studied the Jewish writings. Some of the Jews said the Gentiles were created to fuel the fires of hell. That's cold. Now, they had, now watch. For anti-Semitism, some of them were very cold-hearted and discriminatory. Huh? Yeah. I believe they might have started anti-Semitism. <laughs> I studied, uh, talked to a friend of mine. I had to do a funeral once, and um, I was talking about overcoming. He said, Brother Harris, it is said that even the Jews, when they crossed the Red Sea, it is said among the sages that they all took a different path. They didn't even walk together. They were proud of their tribe. And tribalism does create some nepotism. Uh, 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 we call it segregationism, whatever it is. They don't like, in America, the Indians, that's why they were easy to conquer. They had all the different tribes, and they didn't even like each other. But if we're the children of God, blood and washing spirit feel, can't we be more the children of God than anything else? The Spanish, Ukrainians, they say what? We're the children of God. <coughs> That's what the enemy capitalizes on is our differences. There are differences, but we have in common is more stronger than what we have a different. Would you agree? So God is faithful and he saved us. Um, of course, Abram is the father of the faithful. When God made a promise to him, he waited 25 years. Now, he didn't wait. Now, here's the difference. I look at Sarah in the Old Testament and Sarah in the New Testament. 
uh, in the New Testament book of Hebrews, he counted her faithful. But what he's doing, I figured out, in the New Testament, he's speaking of his ability to transform and to finish the work in her. Some of us are frustrated by where we are, not having confidence what he's able to do, what he's promised. Uh, I read a book with a, with a men's retreat once, and, I'm, and the bishop, I remember he motioned some of what Bishop Jakes talked about when he was a kid, he was small as one of his siblings. And went to school, they went on the pathway at Mulberry Mor Bush, and the sticky ones on either side, and he was too little to climb over the rock or jump on it. And he would cry because he couldn't get over the, over the rock. And his father would come pick him up and put him on the other side of the rock. Some of us run into a rock we can't get over. But when you get over it, nobody never know unless you tell them you struggle in that area. Sometimes things, into our maturity, some may, I did a little switch one time when I was preaching and said, when he, when he could swear by no greater, he squared by his own self. An example I made was about three, four young brothers there. I said, your mark, get set, go. And, and then one guy took off. I said, no, not you, just him. He went to the door and he disappeared. And I kept on talking, and the guy, the Lord got you standing in the starting position. You're still standing there. And others are going. You feel like you've been left behind. He said, I come with your ministry. I come you ain't doing this. I come you ain't doing that. But the Lord is feeding you more while you're sitting there. You're getting greater instruction, being prepared for greater battles, to run a longer race. The other guy went to the door, he was never seen again. And the Lord determines when you start your race, when it's time for you to run, because he knows the plan for your life. Now, people you understand, God has a plan. And when I heard somebody talking, they said, she said, my mother told me, if you want to make God laugh, tell him the plans you have for your life. It's comical because you don't have the power to bring it to pass. God has a plan for our life. He said, I know the thoughts I think to you, towards you. Thoughts of good and not of evil to bring an expected end. I also listened to a uh, Christian broadcast. And guy was talking to the commentator. He said, Lord, give me a revelation of something. He said, when the scripture says, the Lord says, I know you not. What he's saying is the work you done was not the one he initiated. So I don't even recognize you or the work you're doing. I didn't call you to that. I don't even know you. So be careful what we're doing is what he assigned for us. That's in faithfulness. So faith, he chooses the path. And some of the tests we go through is a lesson that will make us what we ought to be. All pain not make to, meant to make you cry or to hurt you, make you lonely. Some things give you a greater insight, make you able. Uh, and this scripture I'll share with someone. It says, I'll make you fishers of men. I'm going to close out. And make you fishers of men. We think of throwing a fishing pole out with a line and waiting to reel it in. But sometimes, guess what? He's going to make us the bait. And then he put what he called a downrigger. It's a weight you put on the line. You have a, a bait and a, where the fish are at, maybe at 200 feet down. And 200 feet down, this current is running either way. So you got to get a weight that carries you down past those currents. Down. So a real fisherman decides what kind of fish you want. You know some more fish, and hope you catch a, a perch or a crappy or a bluegill or bass. He may go fishing for some uh, yellowfin tuna or some bluefin tuna or something else that make any sense. So I'm, I'm going to get you fitted to go fishing. And he didn't tell you this, but what? He's going to make you the bait. How are you going to make you the bait? Something you say because of your experience, they heard it from the depths of your soul. I heard Bishop Ellis say, there's people that identify with me that I can't identify with them. But something they heard, they hear in your voice, something make you understand where they're at and who they are. So faith is me what? I'll stay in the process until I'm matured for the purpose I was called in. One point I'm going to put on for sure, I'm going to quit right here. Sometimes the Lord gave Moses and Paul and the ones, gave them faithful people to help them. Sometimes my faithfulness isn't for me. My faithfulness I was given to someone else to help them. To be a blessing to them. It could be a bishop, my pastor, the, the youth chair, the missionary chair. And you can become, you can become uh, Paul and Silas, uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, Joshua and Moses, Moses and Aaron. 
and, and the Lord gave Moses, and they did a, a, a work that, that, that stands throughout history, notable. I dare to say Moses would have burned out quicker if Aaron and Joshua wasn't there. At least somebody going to tabernacle on your behalf to pray for you. I look at our, at our convention working close. I see sometimes some people need, but some people need help. They try to do too much on their own. But sometimes you're forced to work on your own because you can't find anybody else that's committed enough to help. Um, um, in that regard, I do what I can now, and I go home and go lay down. I came around, I used to get up at early, 6 o'clock in the morning. My first, I used to go to the store at 6 o'clock in the morning waiting the store to open up. But since COVID, most things open at 9.30 anymore. So I got to wait. And by 9.30, I don't forgot. <laughs> well, I don't have the energy. At certain days, I can do things. But also, uh, people ask me to help. I can help you, but you got to come get the help that I have. I mean, I, I learned that we I literally considered a commercial property. So I don't know how to make that sale when I go to do stuff. I can buy stuff you can't buy in the store. Commercial grade, you have a license, but I know how to do it. that. When the guys will come cut the grass, I'll ride with those guys. They will cry, too many problems, the family troubles, whatever it is. But I, I watch where they bought stuff, how they bought it, what they bought, how they mixed it, how they did it. So faithfulness, like with Elisha, even though he washed uh, 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 Dawson called me Elisha. Even calls, he's the man that washed the hands of Elisha. That's a great honor. We learned the anointed secrets, how he dealt with stress and trouble. Amen. So not just wash his hands, you learn other things. But some people, through their faithfulness, when God considers you faithful enough, he will give you to someone to serve to become greater. Most great people in the Bible served somebody. They weren't just great by themselves. They served somebody. The days where everybody wanted to get tired, they quit. They, they say, I'm done. The day is over. I'm gone. And you look around, and they're gone. That's what we do. That's what we take names for. So we have the right to call you because you said you're going to do it. But sometimes people say they're going to do it, and they don't show up, don't feel guilty, and don't feel bad. But God is keeping a record. The judgment seat of Christ, the rewards are going to be given to the saints for things that were done as we serve God here on earth. But thank God, it's a privilege to serve God. It's a privilege to be kind of faithful. And some of you, God allowed you to see the other end. How long since Marion was you, for your husband got saved, you were saved? I'll say 31 years. Yeah, 31 years. So you're allowed to see on the other end of 31 years. And Frank and I used to go together, get fish together, ride together, laugh. He said, man, he said, I know being saved was this much fun. Yeah. So if I'd known so I would have got saved sooner or earlier. And he, he, he turned me on to eating crappy, which is a black pan fish, really sweet. And we go to a place in Belvin, the Secretary of State's office is closed out now and buy some fish. And I go buy some fish and said, Frank, I bought me and you some fish. And your half tastes as good as, just as good as mine yeah. did. <laughs> I eat <ate> all of it. <laughs> but the time would have it. <laughs> I would have it. Amen. He lived his, served his course 31 years. Amen. And while she was serving 31 years, she was in the bathroom. Somebody in the bathroom the bathroom was talking about her. She heard him. She didn't know she was in the bathroom. She this and she that. She said, I'm just trying to keep my husband. Is that what you said, Mary? Yeah. People don't understand. Amen. God bless you. So I encourage you today, saints, be faithful. The Lord is soon to come. As crazy as it is, he has not forgotten his word. In scripture I read in Timothy, he will not, or he cannot deny himself. And what he said he's going to do, guess what? He's going to do it. Amen? And so I'm studying the more, trying to understand God, asking God for my healing, my deliverance, my help. Amen. And, and, some, and some energy to go with it. I, mean, I got a lot more than I had. I couldn't even walk out the front door, but I could walk into my driveway down the street little ways. But thank the Lord for the brothers that went with me to uh, St. Louis to help me out. It was a great blessing. I need that help. So God bless you all. Remain faithful. There's things we do here yet today that somebody has to be faithful uh, to keep things going. Ministry. Whatever you think of it is, somebody can look back to me and they'll say, I don't know how they did it. But guess what? You did it. How? 
because God helped us. Amen. God bless you. B, are you still in the choir? 